I'm Tim Bewes, Interim Director of the Kogut Institute for the Humanities at Brown University, and I'm delighted to introduce this conversation with Peter Zendi, who is David Hurley, Professor of the Humanities and Comparative Literature here at Brown. My conversation with Peter took place on April the 19th, a few days after his article, Viral Times, was published on the In the Moment blog, hosted by the journal Critical Inquiry. Zendi's article is the latest in a series of pieces that reflect on the COVID-19 pandemic. His piece returns to Michel Foucault's concept of biopolitics, a model of governmentality that appears according to Foucault at the end of the 19th century, and is defined by Foucault as a shift of attention on the part of power away from individual bodies subject to discipline and towards human beings considered as, quote, a global mass that is affected by overall processes, characteristic of birth, death, production, illness, and so on, unquote. Biopolitics is concerned not with punishment or exclusion, as in the classical model of sovereignty, but with the management of populations, with hygiene, birth rates, mortality, and processes of centralizing information and normalizing and regulating knowledge. Zendi registers a limit in Foucault's analysis while at the same time holding to a Foucauldian methodology. In other words, he wants to retain the possibility of an episteme or a social theoretical model of political governance, uh, and he asks questions which include, how do we understand the contemporaneity of the COVID-19 event using the technologies of discipline, sovereignty and control identified in the Foucauldian analysis? What use and standing can such a theoretical analysis have in the face of this life and society changing event? How are we to understand its way of being concurrent with major structural changes in our society? Or as, as Zendi himself phrases the question, what is the coronavirus the metonymy or synecdoche of? I began our conversation by presenting him with this overview of his article and asking him if it seemed to him to grasp the central concerns of his piece and whether there was anything he wanted to add as we began the discussion. His reply to that question begins the conversation that follows. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much for, for hosting me uh, and for, for this opportunity of uh, discussion, a dialogue that I really look forward to. Uh, in these uh, isolated uh, times that we are living. I mean, not everybody, but, but uh, as far as we are concerned. And um, uh, I think you perfectly characterized um, and, and uh, summed up the, the, the general argument of, um, of the article that I, I wrote. Um, what maybe I, I would uh, not so much add as repeat, uh, is that, um, yes, I find that uh, there has to be a, a critical reading of, um, of this sort of sequence of uh, paradigms or epistemies, uh, sovereignty, <clears throat> disciplinary power, and biopolitics. Uh, we could even add uh, Gilles Deleuze's uh, control societies, uh, so uh, this succession, this, this sort of, of, um, of, of chain of paradigms uh, has to be read critically. Um, critically means uh, that I, um, I try to lend an attentive ear uh, to the moments, um, of, uh, to the passages from the one to the other, uh, and, um, and uh, what remains within each of these paradigms or epistemes, uh, what remains as a, as a sort of internal polyphony, an, inter, an internal uh, contradiction between various times. Um, so I try to, to lend an attentive ear to what resists this um, distribution into uh, paradigms. Uh, but this, and that's what I want to stress or emphasize, this doesn't mean at all that uh, I wish to completely throw away the very idea of these uh, paradigms or epistemes. I think they provide us with absolutely crucial, um, crucial uh, critical categories. Indeed, we, wouldn't, we would be completely unable to think uh, what, uh, what is uh, happening to us without these very paradigms. Well, let's talk a little bit about the paradigms and about their um, their continuing um, um, 
the, the continuing imperative of their, of their usefulness. Um, because in a way, what I took, one of the um, aspects of your argument that I, that I took, and in particular, the use of the term heterochrony, was a sort of tension between precisely um, the paradigm paradigmatic thought and, uh, and I wondered, I suppose, whether heterochrony uh, or the time differential was a new paradigm or the, or the end of paradigms. I, I, so I, I, I guess I still have that, that slight question. Um, and w this, this question sort of comes into, into um, fruition in the piece where you, where you ask the question, what is the mode of the coronavirus contemporary with? Um, so the mode of biopolitics is contemporary with ecology, which I, I, I find amazingly um, sort of rich and clarifying. Um, and, and I went back to Society Must Be Defended to, to look at these passages. And there, biopolitics, uh, Foucault says, biopolitics will derive its knowledge from and define its powers, uh, field, fields of intervention in terms of the birth rate, the mortality rate, various biological disabilities, and the effects of the environment. So, so you have the question then, what is the coronavirus pandemic contemporary with, if, if not ecology? And um, one, I mean, one question that is, was occurring to me really throughout reading your piece is, and, to, and really to put it in kind of straightforward terms, um, what is the current global pa pandemic or a current global approach to the pandemic best seen as, uh, is it best seen as part of the biopolitical paradigm, which seems to be how Giorgio Agamben, Agamben is seeing it? Or is it a breaking of that paradigm? Is it the appearance of profound and sort of, dev and sort of crucial limitations of that paradigm? I guess I want to ask. Um, and the paradigm, of course, is a paradigm of control and of discipline and, and of, uh, it's a social and political paradigm. Uh, and I, so I wonder whether there's two sides of that question. There's the global, there's the global response to the corona pandemic. And then there's also the American response. And, uh, and I wonder whether um, the American response should be still um, conceive, conceived within that the, the, the paradigm of, of the biopolitical. Um, and uh, in particular, what about the federal American response? What about, um, what about uh, the Trumpian response? Does that also register um, limitations of the biopolitical paradigm? In the article in the Viral Times, uh, I uh, mentioned that it's true the, the contemporaneity of environmental, of the, the, the rise of environmental awareness, let's say, and, um, and the birth of uh, biopolitics, as mentioned by uh, Foucault himself, as we yeah. report. But um, I mainly focused on uh, what Foucault uh, characterizes as a simultaneousness uh, of, on the one hand, uh, epidemics and uh, sovereignty, uh, sovereignty, the paradigm of sovereignty on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, the simultaneousness of, um, let's say, disciplinary power and biopolitics. I mean, Foucault sort of combines them in a, in a common uh, paradigm, internally differentiated, of this disciplinary slash biopolitical paradigm uh, as contemporary with um, endemics, endemic uh, diseases, uh, recurring but, but controlled in a way. Now, what seemed really interesting to me is that uh, with, this, um, with this new uh, pandemic, uh, we have a, a sort of contamination between these two forms of illness. And I, I want to, to make it very clear, I'm not talking uh, about these uh, illnesses uh, as an epidemiologist would or as a... Uh, I, I know nothing about epidemiology, but I'm talking about them as uh, conceptualized by certain critical thought um, uh, epitomized by Foucault. Uh, so, uh, if uh, what we are witnessing uh, belongs neither to the, to the, let's say, to the philosophical uh, concept of, of um, epidemics or, or uh, endemics, uh, if it is 
uh, more precisely maybe the contamination of the one by the other and vice versa. Uh, that's why I coin at a certain point this uh, a monstrous uh, lexical formation uh, as a sort of virus uh, in a, or lexical virus, uh, what I suggest we would call a panendemic. Right? Um, then, uh, uh, as a mirror effect, uh, we could ask uh, what about uh, the, the, the societal uh, paradigms uh, that we are uh, that are revealed. Uh, by this uh, virus. I mean, what I mean is that on the one hand, we, we don't really know how to characterize uh, this panendemic. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, as, a, as a sort of uh, backward effect, um, we don't really know how to characterize the kind of society that this uh, viral panendemic belongs to. Uh, so that's one thing. But then, uh, I, I continued, um, uh, you know, reading Foucault and, and uh, reflecting upon these things, and um, well, I um, I found that uh, that in many ways, uh, in uh, society must be defended, which is the the, uh, the lecture course when, where Foucault defines this, these two forms of uh, this what, what I call in the article a nosological political paradigm that. I mean, this, this co-belonging of a certain kind of illness and a certain technology of power. So in this lecture course, uh, there is another very, very interesting uh, passage um, that I don't mention in the article, but maybe I, I can mention it now. Uh, it's, a, it's a passage where Foucault uh, talks about um, the excesses of uh, biopolitics, uh, by referring to the atomic power uh, and also uh, by referring to the possibility of a virus uh, that would be um, so out of control that it would become universally destructive. So there are these two possibilities that he considers um, a worldwide uh, nuclear uh, uh, war and uh, the, the, the birth of a virus that would be, uh, as he, he himself says, universally destructive. Now, what, is, what seems to me very interesting is that uh, in both cases, um, what is at stake is an excess. In the, in the case of the, of, uh, the, atomic, uh, the atomic power, the use of, um, of the atomic power, um, he says that it's not simply the power to kill, and I'm quoting, in accordance with the rights that are granted to any sovereign. Uh, so clearly he associates the use of uh, nuclear warfare uh, to uh, a certain uh, idea of sovereignty, to the paradigm of sovereignty, as the, the hyperbole of, of the sovereignty paradigm. Uh, so the, the, the generalization without limits of the right to kill. Right. But then, and this is what is so interesting in this example, uh, he says that uh, the, the use, I quote, the use of the atom bomb uh, rep represents the deployment of a sovereign power that kills, but it is also the power to kill life itself, therefore to suppress itself insofar as it is the power that guarantees life. So uh, it's the use of a sovereign power that would destroy uh, this power itself. Now, what is interesting is that the way Foucault describes it, um, it seems um, it's very strange, actually, actually because uh, he says uh, that the use of the atom bomb, I quote again, uh, is also the power for this sovereign power to kill life itself, therefore to suppress itself insofar as it is the power that guarantees life as if sovereignty, sovereign power would guarantee life, which one would think, no, that's what biopolitical power does. Right. Now, and the, the, in the other instance that Foucault considers, uh, the possibility that um, I quote again, um, uh, it, when it becomes technologically and politically possible for man uh, to, um, uh, to create, to build 
the monster, uh, create living matter, and to uh, build viruses that cannot be controlled and that are universally destructive. That's the other possibility uh, he, he considers. And, uh, you know, I, um, it's true that there are so many conspiration theories uh, going on now for very precise uh, reasons, uh, like, uh, I mean, they, they are spread like a contagion uh, by uh, Donald Trump himself or by, by other people. Uh, the idea that this virus was, the coronavirus was engineered or uh, that it was uh, more or less uh, intentionally released from a lab in China. I mean, all these conspiracy theories. Um, this is obviously not what Foucault is talking about. But it's interesting that um, even if we don't want to hear about these conspiracy theories, and I absolutely don't believe in them for a second, but what is interesting in them as a symptom is that they say something about the fact that the, the, the natural character of this virus um, cannot be opposed to its artificial character. I mean, uh, in both cases, whether it, it has been born, it is born naturally, or if it has been engineered, in, it's, it's the same. I mean, it has been engineered by decades of environmental destruction. Uh, so it's an engineered vir virus in the end. But, um, uh, so getting back to, to Foucault, uh, what he says is that um, the building such a virus, whether, whether it's intentional or, or just uh, environmentally <laughs> engineered, if I may say so, uh, is uh, what he characterizes as a formidable extension of biopower. Uh, so as an excess of biopower uh, compared to sovereignty. So we have these two situations. Uh, nuclear power as an excess of sovereignty over biopower uh, and um, a universally destructive virus as an excess of biopower over uh, sovereignty. And he considers them uh, in a, in a simultane as a simultaneous possibility. So uh, it, there is a sort of uh, chiasmatic excess, if I, if I may put it so, um, of the sovereign power over the biopolitical, uh, and of the biopolitical power over the sovereign power. So, um, and, and uh, this, uh, this is a sign to me that, um, uh, I mean, this is in a way the most Derridian moment in Foucault that I know of, uh, which is fascinating. But above all, it is a sign uh, that these paradigms, uh, they are basically uh, struggling they are basically, their, their very texture, if I may say so, um, is, uh, relies upon an internal uh, struggle uh, between themselves. So each paradigm consists in its very struggle with the other, right? So yep. this is what we could characterize as a sort of uh, heterochrony um, at work or, or micro polyphony at work in the in the very texture of each of these, these, these paradigms. I think I'm going to sort of in a way respond by putting a bit of pressure, um, historical pressure in a sense, both both looking to the past, to, to the way that Foucault um, generated the distinction between endemics and, bi and, and pa pandemics, which is very, very interesting, and your um, your proposition in the paper, and also as you've just sort of um, expounded a little bit, um, uh, that the moment that we're in exceeds the current those existing paradigms, and that the pan endemic is in some in a sense an, an excess of those paradigms. Um, when Foucault talks about um, endemics, he's talking, of course, about the 18th century and conditions that had to be resolved so that order could be maintained, conditions facing the biopolitical regimes. So as he put it, he described endemics as permanent factors which sapped the population's strength, shortened the work working week, wasted energy and cost money, both because they led to a fall in production and because treating them was, was expensive. So 
I mean, I, one of the interesting things you do is resuscitate this concept of endemics um, and a, a precisely, as you just said, place it into a kind of tension with, with uh, epidemics. Um, and, um, and this is what you say in, in the um, article, uh, um, the endemic plague of healthcare systems under capitalism. I think this is such an important moment in your essay. The endemic plague of healthcare systems under, under capitalism, meaning precisely the, the, um, the um, um, weakness of, the, of healthcare systems, right? And the inequality that's in part, of, part of, in, under, of healthcare systems has exploded into a pandemic crisis. The, the latter is the subject of permanent statistical monitoring, of course, but it seems to thwart insurantial preparation and regulatory, regulatory controls. In short, what arises with this new nosological formation is the very time differential between these paradigms to which it belongs while exceeding them in every way. And, I, and, and the question I want to ask is, is about that word exceeding them. And I mean, is it the case that this, the new moment um, exceeds those, those paradigms or is it really something else which, is, which has been occurring to me today? Um, um, is it really that we, that we have not yet broached or really approached the biopolitical, at least in the United States. And, and the question I, I have for you, um, Peter, is, is, um, is, it the, is, it, um, is it appropriate for us to talk about a, a, a new paradigm that, that somehow exceeds the old ones when it's not clear that, um, that we've really even achieved the, 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 the biopolitical? So when I'm reading, reading, rereading Foucault, I've been thinking about, um, you know, the, the, the sort of, uh, um, I've been wondering whether we ever achieved, whether we have ever achieved, even biopolitics in America. Um, you know, this I was I was mentioning to you before we started um, um, recording um, an article um, in the current um, New York Times, today's New York Times. It's part of a special issue called "The America We Need," and it's a very sobering, you know, um, uh, very disturbing. Um, um, uh, um, article uh, overview of the of the current moment that we're in, and uh, it's it sort of it, it occurred to me that um, uh, uh, maybe America, maybe for a brief moment after the Second World War, we had something like the bi a biopolitical uh, uh, um, regime emerge. But but if we think about the you know statements like this, um, this is from the New York Times: the inequalities of wealth have become inequalities of health. A middle-aged American in the top fifth of the, income of the income distribution can expect to live about 13 years longer than a person in the bottom fifth, an advantage that has more than doubled since 1980. Okay, and then, and then it goes on to say this. The United States does not guarantee the availability of affordable housing to its citizens. I mean, we, we know all this, of course. Um, does not guarantee the, the availability of afford affordable housing, as do most developed nations. It does not guarantee reliable access to healthcare, as does virtually every other developed nation. And beyond the threadbare nature of the American safety net, the government has pulled back from investment in infrastructure, education, and basic scientific research, the building blocks of future prosperity. It is not surprising that many Americans have lost confidence in the government as a vehicle for achieving the ends that we cannot achieve alone. So I, I guess my question, you know, reading this, I, I, was, I was thinking, you know, America can't afford, a, a, you know, a Foucauldian critique of biopolitics. What America yearns for is bio, is biopolitics. What we, what we need is the biopolitical. And, um, and isn't it the case that Foucault profoundly overestimated the time frame in which disciplinary formations would, would give way to biopolitical ones? You know, I love reading Foucault, but how could, do we, can we afford the luxury of a Foucauldian critique of biopolitics? Isn't the thing that we need right now is biopolitics as a kind of, as a sort of basis of, of, um, of, um, of, our, um, of our society? So I, I, I wondered how, how you would res might respond to that. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> first of all, when I, uh, when I talk about excess, uh, the excess uh, of one paradigm um, over the other, uh, it's not uh, what I'm suggesting. It's not that we are, uh, we are approaching a new paradigm. 
uh, that, that these existing paradigms, they are in excess uh, over one another, right? Which is different. So uh, they, are working, uh, they are working as differentials. Right? Uh, so, which um, is far from an abstract uh, assertion, because this uh, leads me to a direct uh, answer to your question, which is an urgent question. I mean, this is what we are witnessing uh, dramatically today in, in the US, uh, especially, but not only. Uh, I mean, I come, as you, as you know, uh, from uh, France, uh, where there is a very strong tradition of public health, but it has been completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know there, there have been before the outbreak of the coronavirus uh, there were many many protests uh, from uh, healthcare uh, professionals uh, against the, the the terrible state in which uh, public uh, healthcare has uh, has been put by decades of uh, neoliberal uh, governance in France. So <clears throat> um, I think it has become. Uh, increasingly difficult to um, to sustain uh, that uh, let's say Europe uh, still uh, has a, a valid viable uh, public healthcare system uh, even if it's still better than than the one uh, in the US uh, I mean even if it's better uh, let's suppose uh, distributed uh, but what I wanted to say is that um, biopolitics, so in direct response to your, to your question, uh, biopolitics, I think, if I understand Foucault correctly, has never been about uh, an equal and fair uh, distribution of resources and possibilities. Uh, it's uh, rather about uh, the, let's say, economically reasonable uh, management of uh, what is available. Right? Uh, in terms also of illnesses, epidemics, uh, but uh, it's also about the, the monitoring, the control, uh, and it doesn't mean that uh, uh, I mean, the, the horizon of biopolitics, it would be really naive, I think, to, to think uh, that its horizon is an equal distribution of, of uh, resources. Um, and... Uh, <clears throat> So um, when, when I, I uh, put the emphasis on, um, on this uh, paradigm differential, on this internal uh, uh, polyphony within the, the various paradigms, um, I think this could be uh, useful to, to conceptualize what is happening in America under the proper name Donald Trump. Uh, obviously, one could think that um, there is a very strong uh, biopolitical um, paradigm at, at work here. Uh, I mean, constant uh, monitoring, um, you know, statistical uh, modes of, of, uh, of governing uh, have not disappeared at all. Uh, <clears throat> maybe they have simply uh, shifted uh, from uh, the, the, the state power to uh, the power of uh, big uh, multinational companies like uh, Google or mainly American ones, uh, it has to be said. Uh, so there, there is maybe a shift from the, the, uh, this biopolitical kind of governance uh, from the, the state power to uh, uh, another kind of power, so global capitalist power, but the, the, the seat of which is mainly uh, America. Um, in, in, uh, in front of this, um, facing this, uh, Donald Trump uh, is um, probably the name of a certain revival of uh, at least a fantasy of, of sovereignty. Um, and uh, I think that uh, Foucault's analysis in Society Must Be Defended uh, is strikingly relevant to the, to the current situation, especially when he characterizes racism. Uh, and we could, I think, think of racism in, uh, if that's the good term, in a broader, uh, broader exception. Uh, I mean, it's obviously racism in terms of race, but uh, we could even speak of a social kind of uh, racism. Or um, So what, what I mean is that when Foucault characterizes racism 
as uh, what is needed, what biopolitics need in order to um, in order to include some aspects of the old sovereign right to kill and vice versa, uh, racism as uh, the instrument for sovereignty to exercise its power in biopolitical terms, I think this uh, is absolutely relevant to the current situation. Right? Uh, so, um, well, what, what I would simply say is that I really don't think that uh, the Foucauldian paradigms are simply obsolete. Uh, what I think is that in a way they have become uh, a sort of caricature of themselves, um, not only in Foucault's reception uh, with these uh, very clear-cut uh, moments, uh, you know, like parentheses in time, we, we, we think about as epistemes and then hop, uh, the, the next century will be a completely different episteme. That's really a, a caricature of, of, uh, of these paradigms. But even in Foucault himself, in himself you have many of these moments when uh, you, you have the feeling that uh, he, he, he hypostatizes these, uh, these clear-cut um, uh, transitions, right? Uh, but in other other moments in Foucault, in other passages, you have these very interesting, highly complex chiasmatic relations between paradigms, or the the emergence of one paradigm within the very temporality of another. And these are the interesting moments in Foucault, I think. Yeah, I think what you're what you're saying is also um, it reminds me a little bit of the, of this passage from Abnormal that I was reading um, a couple of days ago. Um, where where he 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 where Foucault talks about the the dream the political dream of the plague and the dr political dream of the, of leprosy so leprosy and plague in abnormal becomes a kind of um, model for in which Foucault talks precisely about the two paradigms of um, of um, disciplinary sovereignty and um, and the biopolitical and that one of the things he says is um, there is an extremely interesting body of literature in which the plague appears as the moment of panic and confusion in which individuals threatened by visitations of death abandon their identities, throw off their masks, forget their status and abandon themselves to the great debauchery of those who know they are going to die. There is a literature of plague, he says, that is that is a literature of the decomposition of individuality, a kind of orgiastic dream in which plague is the moment when individuals come apart and when the law is forgotten. As soon as plague breaks out, the, the town's forms of lawfulness disappear. That's how he characterizes the literature of plague. But he goes on to say, um, but you can see there's another dream of the plague, a political dream in which the plague is rather the marvelous moment when political power is exercised to the full. Plague is the moment when the spatial partitioning and division of a population is taken to its, its extreme point where dangerous communications, disorderly communities and forbidden contexts can no longer appear. And I wonder if, if that, if that um, partly at least in some tiny part of it Part of it characterizes the the something like the global capitalist um, um, paradigm that we're also emer emerging into, um, uh, and again the seat of which I think you I think you, I like the way that you phrased it the seat of which is Amer is America and that can that you know so we we can sort of see where uh, uh, so we're, we're not simply in this uh, in other words this extreme point of tr of Trumpian. Um, uh, phantas phantasmatic sovereignty is not um, um, different from uh, uh, what's happening in Europe. It's really part of it, and perhaps it has something like a heterochronic relationship to it. Um, I wonder if that's partly what you mean by your use of the term heterochrony, and then also the use of the term polyphony mm -hmm. uh, earlier on in the, in the article. Mm. Uh, maybe we could talk about those that the temporal dimension of your of your piece in those days. Yes, absolutely. Maybe um, what I can also say, I, I will uh, immediately get back to this notion of heterochrony, which uh, I think is really crucial. And I know you're, you're also uh, working on it in many ways. Um, but what I could say, since you mentioned uh, the, the lecture course at the Collège de France uh, from 74, 75, the, the abnormal, yes. Uh, yes. This there, uh, it's specifically in the passage you mentioned about plague and, and uh, uh, leprosy. Um, 
there is one of these moments uh, in an exemplary way where temporalities are so complex that uh, that it's really interesting in terms of of this polyphony that we are talking about so uh, this is the moment when uh, Foucault, Foucault um, uh, says, I quote, we still describe the way power is exercised in these terms. It's on page uh, 43, I think. So he says that uh, the, the, the paradigm, let's say, of the, the exclusion of the, of the leper, right? Uh, it is still uh, the, the way we describe, these are still precisely the terms in which we describe the way power is exercised. And then, immediately afterwards, um, uh, a paragraph further, he says that this model of power, uh, I quote, finally disappeared roughly at the end of the 17th and the beginning of the 18th centuries. So he just said that we still describe uh, in these terms uh, the way power is exercised. Then he says uh, that it finally disappeared uh, well before uh, our times. Uh, and uh, he adds that it was replaced by a different model, as he calls it. Um, but that different model, so the one you mentioned, the control of, of uh, and the partitioning of plague-infested towns, this different model, he says, is as old as the previous one, but it has been reactivated. So we have a super complex inter temporal uh, interaction here. Uh, it's a paradigm that still continues, but has been replaced. Uh, and when it has been replaced, it has been replaced by a new one, uh, which is supposed to be more uh, contemporary, uh, but this, this new one is as old as the one it replaces, and it is being, simply being reactivated. That's exactly what I call a heterochrony or, or a, a temporal polyphony. Uh, heterochrony provided uh, that we, um, we take the, the precaution, I would say, uh, to, um, to distinguish uh, the, the use I would suggest, and I'm sure you, you would agree with me because uh, we've already discussed this uh, around Bakhtin and you, you mentioned interesting passages in Bakhtin that go in this direction. So distinguishing, let's say, let's call it the, the Bakhtinian uh, idea of heterochrony uh, from Foucault's use of the term, uh, because Foucault himself uses the, the word uh, heterochrony, but in a very specific way that is, I would say, uh, reductive. He uses it in this famous article uh, titled Of Other Spaces, where he talks mainly about uh, what he calls heterotopias. Mm -hmm. um, so these other spaces that are not utopias, but uh, these enclaves, let's say, of a different space within uh, uh, the, the, the space uh, we, we live in. Uh, and by analogy, he suggests that um, uh, heterochronia, uh, heterochrony, uh, would be a sort of enclave of a different time um, within uh, within a, a chronological time or within the, the, the passing of time. Uh, and he gives a number of examples, uh, cemeteries. And, and the, the other example is as interesting, uh, archives, uh, libraries. Yeah. Uh, so this is where time doesn't pass, uh, right? Time is at a standstill. Uh, so, I mean, obviously there is a form of, of polyphony uh, in Foucault's notion of heterochrony in the sense that within the, the flow of time, there is a standstill, there is a suspended time, but uh, it's like a bubble, it's like an enclave where time is, is at a standstill, is, is halted. Right. And yeah. that's, not, uh, that's not how I would like to think about heterochrony uh, because uh, within this bubble or enclave, it seems that uh, there is a homogeneity of time, far from a heterogeneity. Right. Right? Uh, whereas what I find interesting uh, in these passages of, by Foucault, we, we commented, uh, and many others, is that there is um, a conflicting multi-temporality at play, and not just a parenthesis, like, like in a cemetery. Yeah, that's, that's really, really helpful, Peter. And in fact, it, this also speaks to the complexity of the term regime in, uh, in Foucault and also in, in other figures who use it, like Ranciere. Uh, and it's, it sort of um, crystallizes the sense in which 
um, even when Trump is indulging in this very sinophobic uh, rhetoric, this racist uh, rhetoric around the, the causes of the coronavirus, calls it the Chinese virus, the, the Wuhan virus, even in the, when we're in the grip of this, um, what seems almost a, a kind of old, older um, form of, um, of, um, of phantasmatic sovereignty, uh, even in, I mean, in a sense, our very outrage at that, uh, at that um, at that rhetoric is also part of something else. It's hetero. It's a heterochrony. In fact, I mean, it coexists with our outrage. It coexists with the possibility that the New York Times will will write this quite radical, really, for the New York Times um, analysis of of, of uh, the place that America is in, the challenges that face it, the opportunity that we have to remake things at the moment. So I I take what you're saying about hetero heterochrony um, being not quite what Foucault is, uh, is, 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 is talking about um, and not quite what Bakhtin is talking about either but, but, but certainly a way to kind of grapple with the way that power and um, discourse is operating within the, the grip of the current uh, moment. Mm. Um, if I may just add a few words about this, uh, because I'm thinking of a passage that you gave me uh, from, uh, from Bakhtin. You, you drew my attention on this marvelous passage um, uh, where Bakhtin, uh, in uh, I think it's a late essay on, uh, on Goethe, uh, where he, uh, speaking about Goethe, uh, he says that um, for him, for Goethe, I'm quoting, contemporaneity, is revealed as an essential multi-temporality, as remnants or relics of various stages and formations of the past. Right? Uh, so I think uh, this is pretty close to uh, what is happening in these very strange moments when uh, Foucault um, you know, shows that uh, from within the biopolitical paradigm there is this resurgence of sovereignty or this excess of sovereignty uh, that uh, sort of spills over into biopolitics as in the examples of, of nuclear power uh, versus uh, universal uh, virus. You know. <laughs> um, um, can I ask about the occasion of your writing the article? Because um, uh, a few weeks ago, I remember we were talking a bit about, um, about the sort of proliferation of articles about the about the coronavirus in particular uh, sort of prompted in a way by Agamben's um, uh, article which is which is making was making very um, deliberate use of, um, of of Foucauldian categories of biopolitics and at that point you said um, you know I don't think I, I I'm not going to write anything about this uh, I have nothing whatsoever to say and then about about two weeks later or maybe less than that um, uh, you sent me your your article and it became very apparent that you had something very much to say um, uh, so the occasion of the piece I take it because because of the way that you you don't really mention Agamben here but the occasion of the piece seemed to be um, Agamben's article um, and the introduction of this um, theoretical uh, vocabulary into the current situation um, would you I mean, do you feel inclined to make um, explicit the degree to which, uh, or the, just the occasion of the article and what led you to, to want to, I mean, I think take on Agamben in a sense, or take, take on certainly, certainly a body of, um, of um, essays that had appeared in the grip of this uh, pandemic um, and to register a certain kind of corrective and um, would you like to say something about that, that uh, the occasion of the article? Mm -hmm. uh, it's true that I wrote the article in the midst of um, what our common uh, friend, uh, Alex Garcia Dutman, uh, recently described as a hectic drive uh, to write about the virus. Uh, everyone is writing about the virus. And uh, in a way, I think, uh, yes, Agamben might have initiated, uh, I don't know if you know, he was certainly not the first uh, to write something, but uh, he has crystallized a sort of, uh, of um, 
uh, a will to debate, so to speak. Um, and uh, well, he has, uh, there has been a, a shower of, of uh, criticism uh, raining upon uh, Agamben's uh, first intervention, where obviously it was uh, the end of February. I mean, he uh, completely mistakenly minimized the, the impact of the coronavirus pandemic uh, in Italy, uh, which then uh, shortly afterwards revealed uh, how terribly mistaken uh, Agamben was. Uh, but um, I think that this doesn't invalidate um, other things that uh, Agamben says. And uh, maybe, you know, what I was really interested in um, rereading Agamben in this, in this moment is maybe not so much um, what he's talking about and what everyone's talking about, uh, biopolitics and the state of exception, uh, the generalization of the state of exception, but uh, mainly what he says about uh, civil war uh, in a very short book, which is fascinating, uh, Stasis. Um, and uh, speaking of, of uh, since you were, you were uh, raising uh, questions about uh, how we can understand the current situation in the United States specifically, and uh, about the, the, uh, the politics of, of Donald Trump, I think that um, what Agamben is analyzing and describing in stasis uh, is really, really interesting. Um, because in a way, um, what is happening uh, in these days, since uh, two or three days, uh, these protests uh, against uh, lockdown, uh, so the protest uh, from a certain, uh, certain part of the people against uh, the local uh, government, uh, but it is a protest that is backed uh, from uh, the federal uh, government from uh, by the by the president in in many complex but in the end quite obvious ways um, so this is a very interesting structure uh, I was thinking of uh, about this uh, these events uh, in terms of what Agamben uh, describes he coins a word for it uh, what he describes as adimia uh, it's an interesting word in Agamben's analysis it could be actually added, it almost sounds like another form of illness, you know, not only epidemics and endemics and pandemia, uh, but also ademia. Uh, what he means by ademia, uh, it's, um, it's the, what he describes as the condition, almost as if he were talking uh, about an illness, the condition of the political in, in, uh, in, in the West. Um, that is to say the... The, the, the structural impossibility for the people to be uh, represented. And in the very moment that they are represented, the people, uh, in the very moment the people is represented, the people disappear uh, uh, and, and uh, dissolve into a multitude. Um, now this, um, uh, well, the, the multitude, of course, um, the multitude, is, um, is uh, represents for Agamben without being able to be represented, but the multitude embodies rather uh, the, the threat of civil war, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, this, is, this is in the, in the course of a, of a very close and, and fascinating reading of, of Hobbes's Leviathan. Um, now, what I was thinking uh, in these days is that we have this strange, paradoxical, very dangerous uh, situation where uh, a president uh, pretends to uh, represent the irrepresentable, uh, that is to say this multitude, uh, that uh, a multitude that embodies the threat of civil war uh, against the very power that in a way should represent it. Um, so it's a, it's a completely paradoxical situation. A president who has been elected uh, by the majority, supposedly, that's not true, but <laughs> uh, let's say fic uh, the fiction wants that uh, he has been elected by the majority of American uh, citizens. And he uh, represents uh, or claims to represent this minority 
that is um, that is the the, the, the ferment of, of a possible civil war right so it's a it's an impossible situation and this is a sort of political sickness uh, if we want to think of adimia uh, in terms of, of illness you know uh, that uh, that is really threatening Peter, I just want to, you know, thank you for for uh, talking with me about your article, which I found really uh, super interesting and really one of the one of the really convincing and thought provoking pieces that have come out of this moment. Thank you so much for for uh, <clears throat> for organizing this uh, this conversation, which I really enjoyed, and uh, it uh, I was really happy to to have this opportunity of continuing uh, a conversation that we already started in, in so many other uh, contexts.